I could actually just stay down there and listen to Ty play the drums all morning, eh? I was like, so good. I'm going to just put a plug in for the AV team here. Awesome, guys. Thank you. Thank you for making everyone look good up here. <laughs> They're going, why did you do that to us? So my name is Chris Slaughter. Uh, a lot of my friends call me Sarge. Um, I've been kicking around this house for almost 20 years on and off. I tried being an Aussie a couple of times and uh, didn't so work out so well, so I came back. <laughs> I just couldn't get the accent down, really. Like, so. so anyway, we just follow God and um, he brings us in and out of this place. And I served on staff with Pastor Mike and Pastor Rick for a while. And, uh, and now we're back. And I'm very grateful to um, Pastor Boyd for giving me this opportunity to speak to you this morning, especially in light of the fact that he's not here, right? You know, like when the cat's away and all that, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's live online and it's being recorded, so like you can't get away with too much, right? But anyway, I, I promise I'll behave mostly. So I, um, I can't tell you how good it feels to be home and um, be a part of this house and a part of this body. And today is um, today's a special day. Every Sunday is a special day. It's the first day of a new week. You know what happened last week, all the stuff that was going on, all those things you faced, the, you know, the joys, the failures, whatever it is, that, that was last week and this is this week. And what better way to spend the first day of a new week than opening up God's Word together as a family. But it's not just a special day because of that. It's a special day if you want to make it a special day this morning. Because you see, even amongst all of the millions Billions of people in this world today gathering all over the world. Some are still sleeping, but some are awake. In the midst of that huge crowd, God sees your face. And in, and in the midst of all of the, the shouting and the calling on God, the prayers, the whatever it is, the midst of all of that vocal clamor, God hears your voice. And even if you're not speaking, he hears the voice of your heart. And it's absolutely no accident today that you're sitting here with the people that you are in this place because he led you to this place. And so it is a special day, and I want you to embrace that this morning. It's a special day for me too. <laughs> I want to ask your permission this morning to do something, and that is to endeavor to speak the truth to you today from this book. In our world at the moment, there are so many voices, so much information, in line, online, out of line. It's all over the place. But we have before us this book, God's book, and in it is His truth. And so we're going to look at Scripture together this morning, and then we're going to endeavor to expound upon it. But I want to ask your permission to speak the truth to you today in love. Is that okay? Nice. Okay. Ooh. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, the spirit, spirit of wisdom and revelation. And I pray this morning, Lord, as we open the, this word, you'd speak to us fresh, new, as one body and one mind in this place. Lord, we open our hearts to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Cool. The title of my message this morning is, well... It's various things, but it is <laughs> a working class man overcoming a works mentality. And our central scripture this morning is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And I want to read it to you from the NIV this morning. It says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no man can boast, for we are I'm going to actually give you verse 10 as well. <clears throat> For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Amen. In mid-2008, um, I was living in Brisbane, and um, I was endeavoring to solidify uh, a new role that I had working in a corporate audiovisual company. And I was staying with my good friends, Rick and Marisa Knott, who had very kindly put up with me for a couple of months while I was trying to find a rental property in Brisbane. And Rick had, in fact, helped me get the job in the first place. 
and uh, Ange and, and our children were still back in New Zealand, and I was working 12 to 16 hour days, six days a week mostly, trying to get the cash together to bring them over to Brisbane so that we could um, work towards the vision that we felt we had as a family to establish ourselves in Brisbane. And there, there's a backstory to all of that, but suffice to say, I was determined to make the vision work. And while in Brisbane, I continued to have some health challenges that had plagued me for several years, which included stomach and bladder issues, back problems, anxiety, panic attacks, and insomnia. It's a good little bunch, eh? (laughs) And none of these um, were really helped by my work habits or my diet. And though I ate wonderful fresh meals um, when I was at home with the knots, thank you, Marisa, The rest of the time, I mostly drove through for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Let's just say Hungry Jack was a close friend of mine. I also had a free supply in my job of Red Bull and V. So copious amounts of that poison was going down my gullet as well. And even with all these health issues, somehow, I just kept pushing through, not allowing them to slow me down, working hard for Jesus and for the vision. So this one Sunday, I'd been to church with Rick and Marisa, and then I'd gone home to their house for lunch. And earlier in the week, I had managed to get a rental house. And um, a couple of days beforehand, I'd done a trip to Ikea, bought a bunch of furniture that was back in the house needing to be assembled. And after we had lunch, Marisa's um, sister Cheryl was visiting. And after we had lunch, the ladies decided it'd be a really good idea to watch The Sound of Music, which, I mean, let's face it, it never really is a good idea. (laughs) And for me, anyway, some of you are horrified. But anyway, I was was feeling a bit off anyway. I was really tired, and so I excused myself because I knew if I I wanted a bed to sleep on that night, I need to go home and put it together. Bear with me, I'm getting getting there. When I got to the house, I unpacked all the bed parts, threw away the instructions, <laughs> and sat down to put them together. And when I knelt down onto the carpet in the bedroom, I was aware of something like that was in the carpet that shouldn't be. And I looked down, and there were weevils all through the carpet, which was like not nice because they were Aussie weevils, which means they were bigger than every other weevil you've ever seen. <laughs> and then I looked through the whole house, and they were all through the carpet. And if I picked up the pile on the carpet, it just came off in my hands. And I I was just gutted. (laughs) I had rented the house sight on unseen because I was working when the open home was on. And I'd already looked at about 30 houses trying to find one because at the time in Brisbane, rentals were really hard to come by. I had paid nearly $4,000 in bond to get the house. I got the money together to get Ange and the kids to come over. They were on their way that week. And when I saw that, I just was gutted because I realized they couldn't come and I would have to deal with all this. Something happened at that moment in my life that triggered a reaction in my body where I literally felt all of my strength, all of my resolve, all of my drive, all of my vision just drained out of me onto the floor. My knees gave out and I fell onto the floor. I was just destroyed. Somehow, after a couple of hours of just crying out to God and amongst the weevils and the carpet, I managed to get to my feet, but my emotions were shot. I couldn't hold my thoughts together. I couldn't put a conversation together. And my head was full of very dark thoughts, accusations in my head about failure, all sorts of like just nasty stuff straight in from the devil. And I, I don't know how I managed the next 24 hours, But I managed somehow to book a trip home to New Zealand. I waited it out in the dark until the taxi arrived. I got home to Ange, collapsed into her arms, and she drove me home to her parents' house, and I crawled into a bed in the fetal position where I stayed for several days. After a while, Ange got me to a doctor, and they um, they diagnosed me and and said that I had... Um, had an emotional breakdown and that I had GAD, which is 
not EGAD, it's generalized anxiety disorder, and I had clinical depression. And they were right. I was, I was, I was had it. Life's demands had become too overwhelming for me. Physically, mentally, and emotionally, I was just broken, useless for anything. But here's the thing that I've learned, church. Yes, the stress and the bad diet and the panic attacks and the struggles and the intense disappointment and all of those things had overwhelmed my human frame, but I had not been overwhelmed by the circumstance. I had been overwhelmed by a works mentality. After failing to live in the grace of God for my life for nearly 20 years, my human frame gave up. Well, that was heavy, eh? But it's okay, we're going, we're going to go back up. I swear that time goes faster when you get up here. Anyway, let me tell you about grace. You might have heard of grace. In the, in the uh, dictionary, it says that it's the unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification. It's a virtue coming from God. You might have heard it said that God's grace is his unmerited favor towards us. But I want to tell you this morning that it's so much more than that. The, the grace of God is the gift of his abundant life. You see, when God created mankind, he was already living a perfect, fulfilled life. There was nothing missing in God's world. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity was complete. But out of this completion, out of this fullness of his heart, God desired to make somebody to share that life with. His life was, is so full and so abundant that he wants to share it with us. He didn't make us to fulfill a need in his life. He made us to share his abundant life with us. See, I don't, I don't think you grabbed that. <laughs> he didn't make us to fulfill a need in his life. He made us to give us the gift of the same abundant life that he experiences. We don't become God, but we are sons and daughters, children of God. What parent doesn't want to share their life with their children? And you might be like me, you might think, yeah, but you know, I can't, how can I have that kind of life? I mean, look at me, look at, I know what I've done, I know, I know who I am, I can't, I can't come before God. I got a two-word answer for that, but Jesus you see, Jesus is the gift of grace. Let me give you a picture. In the Old Testament, they, the Israelites, this is pre-Jesus, they used to have to bring a lamb to the temple that would be sacrificed for the atonement of their sin. The lamb had to be spotless. And when they came in, they brought the lamb and they, and they put the lamb before the priest and the priest examined the lamb to make sure it was spotless. But here's the thing. The priest looked at the lamb, not at the person who was bringing the lamb. Jesus is the lamb of God. When we come before God with Jesus, he's not looking at us. He's not looking at our lack of righteousness. He's looking at Jesus. And then he sees us in the light of the lamb of God, which is Jesus. Do you see it? Do you, I mean, do you see it? We are made righteous in the sight of a holy God because of the Lamb of God who is Jesus. And do you know what? That sacrifice happened once for all eternity, for every single one of us this morning. Before you were born, God took care of your salvation, my salvation, because the only way he could bring that gift of grace was through Jesus. And through what he did on the cross, we sung it this morning, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that's where our faith comes in. All we have to do to receive that salvation and that abundant life is have faith in Jesus who gave his life. I love how the King James Version puts our scripture this morning. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Here's one more thing about that grace. I said before that God sees our face in the crowd. Do you know what? If there was no crowd, 
if it was just you, he still would have done what he did. He still would have gone to the cross. So we we have this wonderful grace in our lives. But what I've noticed over the years, especially in my life, but in the lives of lots of people that I interact with, is that people at some point in their lives have no problem believing and having faith for salvation. They see what Jesus did. They understand their, uh, you know, we understand our sinfulness and we understand that he is our savior and we accept that and we, we, you know, like we receive the salvation of God. But it seems to be another thing to receive the abundant life of God. People still run around feeling unworthy of the fullness of all that Jesus died for. Yeah, I'm going to heaven, I got my ticket, I'm safe. But, you know, there's so much more. An abundant life, bringing heaven to earth. It's quiet in here. But we can annul that grace in our lives by our works. We read it this morning. Here's where I went wrong. I spent my childhood trying to earn my father's love. For whatever reason, it felt to me like my dad only really showed me affection when I had completed the list of jobs that he had given me and properly. I had to earn any playtime that I had. I, I, I had to earn it by first working. Work first, play later is what I grew up with. And likewise, I learned that if I failed at the work, I then didn't deserve the reward that was previously promised for the work. In fact, sometimes there were other rewards that weren't much fun. Just a sidebar here, me and my dad are all good, okay? (laughs) This is not about his heart, this is about how I received stuff as a kid. See, this flowed, once I got saved at 18, that attitude flowed over into my experience as a Christian. Because you see, I I felt like, you know, surely I must have to do something to maintain this salvation. Surely I must have to work for God to earn his favor. Sound familiar to anyone? (laughs) But you see, if we feel that we have to earn God's favor, then we're annulling the grace that he died for. We've taken the grace of God and exchanged it for a performance-based religion. It's called self-righteousness. The problem with that is we're never good enough on, on our own accord. The... The central um, scripture that we have today in the NLT translation that defines it perfectly, it says this, God saved you by his grace, and when you believed, sorry, when you believed, and you can't take credit for this, it is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Now, I'm, <laughs> I need to be honest with you here, because you see, even though I can draw a direct line to my upbring, upbringing and forming the way I was thinking about earning God's favor, the truth is that deep down inside, I actually liked feeling a little bit like I earned it, like I deserved it. Great job, Chris. Well done. Man, you're awesome. Legend. Thanks for doing that. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, it's just God, you know. You okay out there? Did I lose some friends? Let me tell you about the self-righteousness test. If you think that there's no self-righteousness in your life, approach a mentor or a pastor or someone you're close to and just say, here's what I want you to do. One day when I'm busy and I'm in the middle of doing something for God, maybe the middle of like a church conference or something like that, I want you to come up to me and shoulder tap me about an issue of character in my life. 
Let me tell you, the day they do that, when you're in the middle of all the work and the stress and you're doing it all and they say, I want to talk to you about this, you watch that spirit of self-righteousness just manifest. What? (laughs) I definitely lost a couple of friends there. (laughs) I'm just, you did agree to let me tell you the truth in love. (laughs) If you're a leader, you could flip that around and just, Try it out on someone and see what happens. But you need to be prepared to be part of the answer, right? Because we're supposed to be grace bringers and grace givers. Let me tell you how how I learned this. In the midst of my recovery from the breakdown, I was praying and probably complaining to God. (laughs) And I said to him, how could you let this happen, God? What about all the things I've worked for? What about, sorry. What about all the things I've done? All the things I've built for you? It's all gone now. It's all lost. And I, I haven't, you know, you don't necessarily hear God's voice in your ear, but you know, he speaks something across your spirit, eh? Like, I'm sure you've all had it. But he just said this to me, and this is why it got my attention, because it started with this. Chris. I don't care about any of those things. All I want is your heart. <clears throat> Sorry. I practiced that like four times and I was just <laughs> But this is such an important message for all of us here today. Even if we understand the, the concept of grace conserving our salvation, We lay it down so quickly and so easily for a lifestyle of busy work for God. And unfortunately, you know, in church as a body, we're really good at reinforcing that message to each other amongst the busyness. It's not not necessarily like a, a deliberate thing. It's just the culture that we create sometimes because there's so much to do, right? And we're going to get to that. In our busyness, it's so easy to forget the message of grace that God our Father is entirely pleased with us on the basis of Jesus and Jesus alone. If we never did another thing after we got saved, he would still love us the same. If, if, if you got saved today and something went wrong and all next thing you know you're in a coma, you can't move, you never move again until the day you breathe your last, so you never do anything for Jesus, he wouldn't love you any less than someone who spent a lifetime of being busy for God. The reward is the same, salvation. You would have missed out on a grace-filled life, and hopefully a bunch of people would have been praying for you to be resurrected out of the coma, right? I'm just trying to make the point. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That was a bit kind of like, yeah, that's out there, eh? But anyway. So back to my story, because currently I'm still lying in a bed in the fetal position, broken, overwhelmed. It's not fun, and I don't want to stay there. But praise God, I didn't stay there. As you can see, I'm standing here today to tell you this story that God healed me, that God graciously restored me. Praise you, Jesus. (laughs) And how did he do it? Well, it took a bit of time. Almost two years of rest and counseling and good food and exercise. But even more so, how he healed me was through his gift of grace, through people. Through my amazing wife, Angela. Through my children, my parents, my in-laws, my friends, my neighbors, my mentors. Through complete strangers, God brought his grace to me. It's still, I can't, it's hard to fathom some of the things that people that didn't even know me did for me to enable my healing. I saw Jesus in those people and in their actions. Let me tell you, church, if you want to see the grace of God afresh and evident in your world today, look around you at the people who love and support you. Do you deserve that love and support, or are they just very gracious, grace-filled people? 
So many times we don't see the miracles of grace right in front of us. The one we wake up next to in the morning. The one who embraced you when you came in this morning. That when you arrived. The one who called you this week to see how you were doing. The ones with the arms and legs of grace and mercy and forgiveness and healing and provision of Jesus in their hands. So how do we overcome this works mentality? It's a struggle. Honestly, in our humanity, it can be difficult. I'm healed and it's the revelation of his grace that keeps me healed, but I struggle. I have to constantly remind myself of his grace. I slip so easily into a mentality of working to earn instead of receiving as a son, even after what I went through. Sometimes I find myself doing something I've said yes to and I think, there is no grace for this. <laughs> I am not enjoying this. Why did I say yes to this? I often say yes too much or maybe just too soon. Sometimes the symptoms return and Ange very gracious, graciously reminds me that I am healed. You know, sometimes you can just forget, hey, what God did for you. The symptoms are a blessing in disguise many times, though. They're kind of an alarm for me that says, you're being an idiot again, Chris. <laughs> and I have a couple of scars. I, I have some reduced capaci capacity emotionally and mentally. Some of you said, yeah, well, we already knew that. <laughs> <laughs> but the scars, too, are a blessing. Because they remind me that what I do now, I do in the strength of God, and I do in His grace, by His grace. I am not diminished spiritually. At the core of my spirit, I am free, I am delivered, and I am walking in the grace of God, the abundant life of Jesus for my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And let me tell you this, everything is much, much more enjoyable when you're living under grace, not works. So let me give you three quick keys that I've learned along the way that I believe will help you stay in grace and keep away from a works mentality. Number one, believe. But believe for what God has already done. Don't run around making lots of noise and, you know, asking God to do things he's already done. Just lay hold of them by the power of his grace. It leads straight to number two, which is receive. Now here's a little trick. I did this this morning after I, I stumbled out of bed. I walked into the bathroom. I looked into the mirror and thought, gosh, that's gonna need some work. And then <laughs> I put my hands in the air and I said, Lord Jesus, I receive your grace for today. I receive your grace for this task, for what you've called me to today. Try it. <laughs> it works. And, I, and, and arms up, pray out loud. And sometimes you might need to do it in public. You'll look around, there's no escape. You've just got to do it. And number three, give. As you've received grace, freely give grace. You know, when we give something that God has given us, it, it's like it pops the cork. It creates a flow. If we keep giving, he keeps, you keep receiving, and, it's, and, it, and, it, and so it goes. You are the grace of God to someone. So, is there, is there therefore no work to be done? Uh, no. <laughs> the Bible's clear. For as, in James 2.26, it says this, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. There is much work to do, but you see the works that James is talking about are deeds and actions that are the byproduct of a living faith. They're the byproduct of receiving the grace of God for our lives. They're not the works that seek to justify or make us righteous before God or to earn His presence or favor. They're simply the fruit that grows from someone who is being transformed by God's grace. Likewise, God has plenty of 
good works for us to do that he's prepared for in advance. Ephesians 2.10, as we read earlier, says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So it isn't that there's no work to be done. There's a myriad of works to be done that God has even pre... I mean, have you ever thought about that? God pre-planned it? Not only... Did he go to the cross for you and me before we, were even ex- we even existed? He pre-planned good works for us to do. I mean, what a blessing to step into those. If God planned them, they're going to work, right? <laughs> it's, everything's in place that's needed for them to work. See, these works are good. And they're creative. And they're fulfilling And they're uplifting, and they're full of grace. They're uplifting works of service. They're the works done with God, not for God. What are you doing today, God, that I can join in with? What's the good works that you prepared for me to do today? He wants us to bring his gift of grace So he wants to bring his gift of grace to us and through us. You know, um, Jesus was a working class man. He was a carpenter. Yep, Jesus was a tradie. He was the son of God, but he walked on earth as a carpenter. Like in those days, that was one of the hardest jobs you could do. They didn't have like high abs and cranes and nail guns and, and they used these huge big timbers, you know, cedars and, you know, and I've heard this said once before that they didn't just say Jesus was a carpenter in Nazareth, they said that he was the carpenter in Nazareth. So if you wandered into Nazareth and you said, I need a carpenter, they were like, you need to talk to Jesus. Interesting, eh? He was a hard worker. I love how the Bible tells us that both Jesus and his father are working to this day. And and Jesus said that I only do what I see my father doing. He said this, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. And he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. The greatest work of Jesus was the cross. Can I maybe get the band to come up and I think it'd be really cool just to play nothing but the blood just in behind. The greatest work of Jesus pre-planned by his father was salvation on the cross and while he was there he uttered these words it is finished everything that needed to be done to ensure our salvation and our ability to live this grace filled abundant life was done finished taken care of for all eternity if you're, if you're comfortable and you're able this morning, can I, can I ask you to just stand? If you're, if you're more comfortable sitting, that's fine, but just, if you can, stand. I'm going to ask you to do something to just raise your hands to God this morning. You know, it's the most vulnerable place we can be, standing before our living God. And, and I... I just want to invite you this morning, maybe you haven't come to Jesus before, maybe you don't know him in a way like I've been talking about, or maybe you've known him and you don't, right now you don't feel like you know him like you did. Even if you're like 100% on task this morning, feeling great, I just want to ask, I'm going to pray a prayer in that maybe you just um, pray after me as we um, just call upon the Lord this morning. Maybe maybe it's just a revisit. Maybe it's just a refocusing. 
Maybe it's a brand new day for you. So just pray after me. Jesus, the Bible says, He who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus, I'm calling on your name. Thank you for saving me. I receive your Holy Spirit today. I receive your abundant life today. Help me to live in your grace. Amen. Let me just keep your hands raised. I really believe this morning that the Lord wants to just bring an impartation into your life, a fresh of grace this morning. Father, in Jesus' name, as we lift our hands, I pray for all of us here, Lord, in this room and at home online, that we would understand the fullness of your grace, your abundant life. Thank you, Lord. I declare in Jesus' name, Lord God, an undoing of strongholds of thought, a breaking down, Lord, of the Lord, the temples we've built in our mind where we have to like worship every day at work instead of at grace in front of you. Father, we receive your Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us into all grace today. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. God bless you, church. Thank you for listening.